Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Jankemeyer Khan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Outreach and Public Engagement Coordinator at Stamps Gallery, part of the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. I am pleased to welcome you all here, both on Zoom and Facebook Live, to our virtual exhibition tour with artist Heidi Kumau. This event is being held in conjunction with the exhibition, Real and Imagined Fiberworks and Video Animations by Heidi Kumau, currently on view at Stamps Gallery from September 15th through December 4th, 2020. Following guidance from university administrators and public health officials in response to COVID-19, Stamps Gallery is unable to welcome the general public to the gallery at this time. However, the gallery is open to UM faculty, staff, and students with a valid M card. And if you do have a valid M card and would like to come visit us, you're welcome to do so Tuesdays and Fridays from 2 to 7 p.m. For more information and to review our visitors' policies, please visit our Stamps Gallery webpage on the Stamps School of Art and Design website that we will put into the chat for you to check out. For those of you who have not been to Stamps Gallery before, Stamps Gallery is an 8,000 square foot exhibition space in downtown Ann Arbor, where on a typical year, we host six to eight exhibitions. About half of our exhibition schedule is made up of Stamps School of Art and Design student shows, and the other half of our schedule is made up of solo and group exhibitions with work by contemporary artists and designers from across the country and around the world. Stamps Gallery is dedicated to deepening the understanding of contemporary art and design practices while responding to the urgent questions and events of our time. Our underlying commitment to social justice shapes the development of our exhibitions and public programs, which we hope spark action, inquiry, and conversation. Also on view with Heidi's show are two other exhibitions. Uh, the first is Respond, Resist, Rethink, the Stamps student poster and video exhibition, where STAMP students were invited to design posters and make videos to respond and contemplate what each of us can do to build a stronger community, one that is based on the values of racial equality, justice, and belonging. Also on view is the exhibition, Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote, organized by Kelly Salchow, MacArthur, and Nancy Skolas in partnership with AIGA and the League of Women Voters. We will also be hosting online events in conjunction with those exhibitions. The first takes place Tuesday, October 13th from noon to 1.30 p.m., which is the Response, Resist, Rethink, a stamp student poster and video exhibition panel discussion, which will be moderated by artist and stamps admission counselor, Eriberto Palacio III. Stamp students will speak about their work in the show and be in deep conversation with Eriberto about some of the topics some of the topics presented in their work and a live Q&A will follow. Next, in partnership with UMA, Stamps Gallery is hosting a panel discussion for Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote, the exhibition. This event will happen on Thursday, October 29th from noon to 1.30 p.m. Panelists will include Stamp School of Art and Design professors, Audrey Bennett and Hannah Smotrich, who each have a poster in the show. It will also include Michigan State University professor Kelly Salchow MacArthur. Panelists will be joined by UM Museum of Art Student Engagement Council members Emily Constein and Sarah Jacob. All will share their ideas about the intersection of art, design, and activism. This will also be followed by a live Q&A. For more information, again, please visit our Stamps Gallery webpage on the Stamps School of Art and Design website. So before I introduce Heidi, I want to give you a quick rundown of the event and go over some housekeeping. Um, following opening remarks, Heidi will be presenting and walking us through a virtual tour of her exhibition. Once Heidi is wrapped up, Stamps Gallery Director Srimoy Mitra will join Heidi and kick off our live Q&A session. If you have questions, please feel free to add them in the chat, both on Zoom and Facebook Live. We will be monitoring both, those, uh, both of those feeds throughout the event, so uh, feel free to post questions anytime. But please note, we will, we will not take any questions until after all remarks have been given. So, on to Heidi. Heidi Kumau creates video, machine art, and installations to explore ordinary social interactions and their psychological undercurrents. 
Emerging from the intersection of sculpture, theater, and engineering, her work demonstrates how small gestures, even the most private and poetic, can become political acts. Her work has been exhibited at Fundicio Jean Miro in Barcelona, the San Jose Museum of Art, Museo de Art Moderno in Buenos Aires, and numerous under other venues worldwide. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Creative Capital Grant, among many others. She is also a professor in the Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome Heidi Kumau. Don't forget to unmute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Jennifer. Um, greetings from California. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Stamp Scott Gallery for um, inviting me to do this show and for Srimoyi Mitra for allowing me to put this work up and actually see it. Um, see it with it, with, see all the pieces together. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this event. Uh, before I start talking about specific works, uh, see, um, I am just gonna just tell you, describe what's in the show. Um, just physically, if you were to able to, <laughs> if you were able to visit, um, the show has 33 fabric pieces and these are basically uh, drawings that I've made by stitching and uh, attaching uh, uh, fabric cutouts. And um, so some of the, the smaller pieces are mounted to wood and hung on the wall and the larger pieces are uh, hung with a, a rod in the back. Just so you can sort of imagine them as I'm talking about them. There are also five very short experimental animations uh, on, a, on, a, on a flat screen TV that's not pictured in this picture, but uh, that you can also view if you go to the gallery. I use fabric cutouts and machine and hand stitching on industrial felt to give physical form to the intangible dynamics underlying ordinary conversations and, the rela and relationships from a feminist perspective. Intentionally minimal, each image distills an interaction, traumatic incident, or power imbalance into an accessible visual narrative. Recognizable objects such as chairs, boxes, roots, ladders, and spotlights set the stage for the story to unfold. Events are captured midstream, suspended in time like a, like a felt film still. But rather than animating them, I like to use the fabric narratives, as I call them, um, as notes or suggestions for animations that I might make someday, but also that you as the viewer might complete in your own mind. When I started this work, uh, the questions I asked myself were, how can I represent a conversation or emotional state through images, animations, or gestures alone? How can I represent a conversation and the psychological, emotional subtext of the conversation? And then also, how can I create the presence of a person, but not have a face or eyes? So as I was working that out, uh, I decided and came, across, came upon just basically using a chair as a stand-in for a person. And the, the, the materials of sewing, so thread, string, yarn, um, as the content of the conversation itself. And this string, the string, <laughs> thread string, uh, is often tangled, balled up, connecting and tying disparate things together. In many of these situations, the energy and force of the conversation emerges from one side only. Often it also is, um, there's exchange back and forth. The next piece is animation. Um, 
that uh, con makes the connection, the line come alive. Um, Reimagining what's spoken or unspoken between a woman and her therapist. Okay. A lot of the work addresses communication at a distance or as we now know it as so in a socially distancing way. Uh, and I use a loudspeaker or a spotlight as a head, oopsie, gosh, hold on a second. I think I'm out of order here, sorry. Let me start over. A lot of the communication is, happens at a distance and as we all know it as a social, in a social distancing manner. And I'm using what I guess I think of as a spotlight or as a speaker, uh, as the head or the mouth. And I thought that these objects were useful for me because they're sort of objects that emit something, you know, emit the conversation or the emotion. And so for me, using these roots was one way to talk about the unspoken parts of a conversation or uh, of a relationship and the secrets. One might want to protect those secrets and the other might want to expose them. In this work, I think of exposure as a form of power. It's an ability to reveal information, but it's also a form of vulnerability being exposed. The hearing directly addresses the exposure of secrets in a Senate hearing. After watching the testimony of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford at the 2018 Senate Judiciary hearing for Kavanaugh, I was compelled to create a series of pieces that address the spectacle of the event, the vulnerability of the person providing testimony, and the systemic sexism and power structures that were laid bare for all of us to see. So the exhibition, some of the pieces of the exhibition are inspired by the courage, testimony, and experiences of women like Christine Blasey Ford, who publicly report assault, harassment, or misconduct. The Me Too movement gave voice to thousands of women to tell their personal stories, but it also exposed the hostile backlash meant to silence them. The title, Real and Imagined, is a deliberate contradiction. If one is true, it's usually, the other must not be. Um, in practice, however, both terms are used to reference a woman's testimony and determine how it is publicly interpreted. Her account is accepted as truthful by many and simultaneously dismissed as imaginary by the court of public opinion. Her memory is wrong. She imagined it. Her story then is both real and imagined. 
Individuals who report their assaults are often forced to re-perform their accounts alone, in public, and for the benefit of others. For me, watching her retell the traumatic event was like watching a dangerous solo acrobatic performance. I just couldn't get that out of my head. All of this scrutiny can lead to the woman questioning herself and doubting her own memory, doubting her own experience. And so I examine this self-doubt, not just in the felt pieces, but also in animations. Any woman who has had a gynecological exam knows what it's like to lie back on the exam table with her feet in the stirrups. The lack of control and total vulnerability is palpable. This is a still from an animation. A similar sense of vulnerability and exposure is multiplied when the woman retells her story. It is also multiplied when she is not believed. At its core, this work explores how a lack of control or dismissal of a woman's story is directly connected to the lack of control over her own body. And that's the end of the felt pieces. I can comment much more. Um, to end my session here, I'm just going to add some levity by providing you with a one minute comedy quarantine, quarantine comedy animation. And I'll take some questions afterwards. Breaking news tonight, the deadliest day and the running tally of coronavirus cases in the US topping 100,000. We direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. In Alabama, Governor Kay Ivey had declined to impose a stay-at-home order. We are not Louisiana, we are not New York State, we are not California, and right now is not the time to, to order people to shelter in place. Hospitals stretched to the limit. One doctor saying it's like a war zone. Patients lined up for hours to be tested. Also, the new hotspots, growing concerns for cities like Chicago and Detroit. Prime Minister Boris Johnson tests positive. Vaccine today, around the globe, cases surging. And how do you know when to go to the emergency room for coronavirus? One couple's harrowing story that everyone should hear. The danger for delivery workers. Thousands who work for a popular grocery delivery service set to strike. They say they're risking their lives. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shramoy Mitra, and I'm the director of Stamp Gallery. Um, what a treat to be able to walk through the exhibition and hear about your, you know, uh, the works and everything that informed it. Um, Heidi, thank you so much. Um, and so I will, um, it's my honor today uh, to, uh, to start the Q&A with you. Um, and as we go along, we will be taking questions. Uh, so please uh, feel free to add your questions. Uh, if you're on the Zoom webinar, on the chat there, or um, on Facebook Live, of course. Um, so let's start with, um, you know, uh, with the levity, with, um, you know, the humor um, in, uh, in your work, uh, you, know, um, you know, as you're talking about um, uh, the steamer sort of 
you know, popping little, uh, I don't know what those rice, uh, little snackies, um, you know, oyster as, crackers, right? <laughs> crackers while we're, um, you know, processing this sort of information, also this sort of a sense of, um, you know, accretion, you know, and not, and, and, and the lack of control. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, uh, that's sort of a strategy that I found um, in, you know, in many of your, in your works, of course, the, uh, the animations and also your, um, the fabric works where you're using sort of really everyday objects, right? Um, um, many of them remind me of mm. sort of office settings to our home, of course, chairs are kind, mm. kind of ubiquitous. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that in terms of your strategy about humor um, in particular, um, mm. uh, you know, as a way, um, as sort of kind of perhaps the entry point um, to these uh, sort of larger, um, really um, kind of uh, the larger things, you know, that is happening around us sort of to grapple with them. Um, um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think I tie humor to absurd, you know, to absurdity. Right. And I feel like uh, when things get so extreme as they are right now, it, <laughs> my only word to describe a lot of this stuff is absurdity. Um, and so, in, 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 at least in animation in particular, there is, it's almost a fact that in order to get a point across, when you're animating something is you have to really exaggerate. It's almost like one of the laws of animation is exaggeration, um, especially, especially with something like a, a puppet character like that. Um, yeah, I had originally, I mean, I started to think about this actually just as you were speak, talking about it, but you know, when I was designing that puppet, which is made from a vegetable steamer, um, all I knew as I was developing it was I wanted her to be able to take things in and push things out. So it would be sort of like a mouth, but not making a mouth, or I don't even have a head on that puppet. That's her body and her head. Um, and so I was just sort of at the thrift store shopping, trying to find like, actually I was just looking for a bowl or a cup or something. And then when I got this, when I found this kind of uh, object that also is mechanically easy to maneuver, it just made sense. And then trying to find something for her to consume as a kind of symbolic of, of consuming news. Um, uh, I mean, it could, it could also work with her popping pills too. Um, yeah, it was just a way that to, for me, the, the humor is tied to the excess, you know, and the ability to, uh, <laughs> for me, humor is survival, you know, when you, um, talk to people that live in like a war-torn country or people living under dictatorships or they use humor in such a, in a way as a kind of mode of survival. And um, not that I'm in that extreme of a situation, obviously, but uh, I personally use it as a way to survive. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how, I'd, I'd be interested to know which pieces of the fabric pieces that you might see more, I mean, I guess maybe yeah. the humor just comes from the exaggeration of things, I think. So what I will do yeah. actually right now, um, because I did want to bring us back and refer to a couple of your, um, your fabric pieces, is I'm going to share my screen um, to refer to um, sort of the image that I am thinking about. Um, all right, just one second here. Um, oops. All right, so here we are. Um, this is the website, the web page to Heidi's um, exhibition. And I wanted to share as well with the 
uh, our attendees that all the work that we have seen that Sh Heidi walked us through in the tour are also you can uh, spend time um, with them, uh, with each of them, um, as you if as as you click if you click on these images. Um, and so Heidi, I wanted to refer to this work, um, you know, gray blob, uh, which I just really um, really love. <laughs> uh, you know, it is actually a fairly large piece, um, and you have these two chairs and the gray blob in conversation mm. with another stack. Uh, stack of colors um, um, and um, you know the um, there's you know obviously a lot of uh, humor in this piece but what 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 really struck me as you were speaking was this also this um, you know your sort of subtitle of and one of the works is also titled the Gulf of Mist opportunities right this sort of this you know with the speakers they usually mm, set mm. up you know in a dynamic of two um, you know, sometimes three, but you know, almost the sort of inability to communicate, right? The conversations are just sort of going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they're not, we're not unable to speak <laughs> or, um, you know, put to words. So, um, so yeah. about yeah, that, you're you know, right. to, if you could talk about um, conversation, the strategy of uh, conversation, sorry about that, let me move that. And then, um, and then uh, with that, um, one more thing, which is, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, no bodies, right? Like, um, there's something very performative mm. and theatrical in these sort of conversations that we see unfold on the mm. felt, in the, in the felt pieces. So, um, yeah, could, if you could um, just talk, uh, refer a little bit to that, that'd be great. Yeah, I yeah, you're right. I think Grey Blob is funny, although <laughs> it's sort of referencing as uh, a kind of serious problem, I think, for me was sort of how do I represent uh, a conversation? I see my in this picture, like I see myself as the stack of colors mm -hmm. and then the Grey Blob is sort of when you're doing all the work to make the conversation happen and then there is no response from the other side so that's kind of why i just chose like a non-color uh, uh you know a, not, a, not any variable of color just the shape of it and the color of it for me was just like the exaggerated version of um someone that isn't listening to you or someone that's just not responding um no matter how colorful and energetic you you try to make something happen uh that I, yeah they're, it's just not happening um sorry what was the oh just about conversations in general yeah just kind of boiling it down to like the most basic interaction between people um mm -hmm. Uh, it's just it's just kind of, that was actually like the start of all the work like i i started by doing stick figures with two chairs and then just putting all kinds of things between the two chairs as mm -hmm. kind of oh yeah this that's this conversation and this is that conversation um and then it was sort of how do i make the material speak that for me rather than me illustrating it so perfectly so mm -hmm. i started doing quilting a few years ago and sort of just you know so this is like a teeny meeny meeny uh mini quilt of colors um but yeah i guess uh the humor for me also just comes from the gray and the shape of it and the mm -hmm. exaggerated difference the difference between them right how opposite mm -hmm. they are one sort of more straight and yeah. upright um, that's similar to the red and the green chairs that are having conversation and the red mm -hmm. The red chair is just covered in a net of like tangles. Yeah, um, I think it's that's a, a it's a similar take on this. Yeah, yeah, sort of like and trying to get information from someone and just not quite. Yeah, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So I <laughs> yeah. mean, so we're going from conversation and the sort of um, you know this kind of levity and and and, uh, and humor too i find this work actually quite um, um i mean it's all very powerful but there's almost you're kind of edging to this moment of um you know how do we retell experiences that are um that are not hilarious right that are actually right deeply you yeah. know or, or, or that are traumatic 
or how do we and as as viewers you know how as or you know um when we're witnessing something unfold in front of us um that we have uh limited agency um you know if it's for example you know we saw with um uh, with dr christine blasey ford as you refer to her as sort of kind of an important um um Kind of point of departure for you for this in this series. Um, uh, can you t take us to uh, talking a little bit about this sort of question of witnessing, um, and um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, you know, and uh, perhaps what I, I find really powerful, and especially in this sort of time um, where we're sort of working in our own uh, from our domestic spaces, those of us who can, mm -hmm. um, to uh, you know the impact of what's happening um you know the the, the sort of um the external what's happening uh, in public or in uh, socially in our in our sort of society that sort of the the impact that has on our personal lives and what um you know the sort of ripples you know uh, the ripple sort of effect uh, um <laughs> yeah to, um you know you also mentioned um you know these secrets right within our relationships yeah so, you know that the places we don't go um but we know <laughs> exist yeah. um yeah and I, I find that in your work as well like you know you've used the threads really as a way to perhaps or when i see them it's sort of the sort of fraying right like the sort of on one hand opening up but also mm. um, there is uh really a um uh like a, it, there is a, it gives it sort of a depth or kind of taking us to an unknown space. Um, so yeah, if you could talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, take, starting with uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Ford's, um, uh, you know, that sort of moment for you as you were working on this series yeah. already or um, how, yeah, you contextualize that. Um. Yeah, it was um, something that I had, I was, yeah, I was, I started all of this just with simple, um, uh, <laughs> with simple conversations. Uh, and then when the um, hearings happened, uh, I then, I, I think the main thing was just, I had this sort of gut feeling about the, 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 the risk that she was taking, gut feeling isn't the right word, but I, I had this gnawing <laughs> feeling that stayed with me long after those ended about her solo performance, basically, mm -hmm. and her the risk that she took to testify. And then, you know, she's sitting in a chair and they're all in chairs. And so it's sort of, and then this, the, the scrutiny of the cameras and the TV and the endless stuff. Um, again, sort of like amplifying her, the, you know, the single individual, all of that attention brought on one person. Um, so a, a lot of these pieces have that like kind of focus on, on her. That's, I mean, I literally traced the chairs that I could find in the photograph. So those chairs in the, in some of the pieces are, are literally the chairs that the senators sit in. Um, and uh, this is like the witness chair. Um, so for me it wasn't about like how do i retell exactly like what happened but how do i tell or convey how i interpreted it which or the, the feeling that i had watching it and the kind of feeling that i imagine a lot of people had um the the for me it was a risk so for me when i was developing these pieces it was really i wanted this exaggerated sense of danger you know that this is such a risky thing to take on. So I have a lot of pictures where I was just trying to get to this place of being able to convey uh, a, a steep cliff or a drop or a, you know, where the pieces are, are six feet tall and there's this huge mm. gap in the space that she might fall. Um, and uh, it was really about, and I tried a million different things <laughs> before I sort of got to here, but uh, it was about that 
trying to convey the sense of scrutiny that I felt that like exaggerated scrutiny that was put on her and also the sense of danger and the solo performance that she did, you know, for all of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, com and then sort of using all these symbols that I had kind of started to have in my studio um, to kind of blend the conversation with like the heightened sense of the, the heightened hearing, the dynamics of that hearing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so in a way, sometimes I'm talking more about the senators and less about her. Like the focus isn't always just in my pieces, at least about the, her. It's also about the way this, I felt many of the senators were all teaming up together. And that's why the roots are connected on that. The right. hearing, one of the hearing pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like that it's also about, or just as much about how they behaved and how they acted in that setting. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was, it, you know, a lot of the work is sort of driven by emotional responses to things mm -hmm. and then trying to not illustrate it per se, but get to that feeling right so there's a big distance between her and the senators yeah. as a way to suggest that kind of risk yeah sort of tightrope yeah 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 um, um so i don't know if that answers your question but it was the things i was thinking about yeah um, yeah absolutely um you know i think um i i do have more questions but i think we should turn over to i'm gonna stop the screen share so we can start taking some of the questions and then maybe we can come um come okay. back um so i will read these out um I'm sorry my um so this is a Um, so a question, um, okay, by Samuel Turner asks, how as an artist did you develop your process, creative direction, a motivation when extrapolating <laughs> some ideas? Um, I think your usage of fabrics and its connection to womanhood is wonderful. And as an artist, it's difficult to imagine how I get to that point of ideation to filling up a whole gallery. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, well, what do they say? You know, a, a, a journey is <laughs> done by one step at a time. Um, I, I, um, uh, how did I develop my process? This, um, this is a complete departure for me. This is all new work, you know, and I suppose I should be a little more like hesitant to <laughs> <laughs> show it but I just you know we went on quarantine and I was sort of on art quarantine uh, starting in like December anyway because I had a show that was supposed to happen in New York City in April and so I was kind of on hustle mode <laughs> just to get all that work ready and then we went into quarantine so I had all this stuff and I just said okay I'm just gonna make it you know and just like oh, take advantage of quarantine and just make work um, so that's kind of how I managed to make a lot. Um, and I also stopped uh, holding myself, holding some kind of a thing over my head about what I should be doing. And I just did what I wanted to do. <laughs> so I thought when this quarantine's over, what do I want to say I've done? Like made right. myself visible, actually make stuff that I enjoy making. Um, so uh, at developing a process, I think it's, it actually took me about two years to actually get to this point to get them to where they, how they look right now. I mean, I started just with the idea of conversations and learning, teaching myself how to sew. And somebody, I think earlier asked about um, what the materials are. I looked for a long time to try to, try to find a fabric or a medium or something to stitch on because I knew I'm not a good, drawer, painter, illustrator person. I'm more of a camera based mm -hmm. sculptural person. So um, I, it took me a while to find the right medium to um, draw on or, you know, to sew on. Um, and so this is felt that's about a quarter inch thick. Somebody might have been asking me that. 
um, that I, uh, it's sort of industrial stuff that you can get. Um, they, they use it for like costumes and making bags and things like that, where you need the, where you, whatever you need to stand up. Um, so um, developing a process is really just starting with sketchbook and sort of going with um, mm -hmm. an emotional, <laughs> for me, just like translating an emotional response to something. Um, and sometimes that comes from the news and sometimes it just comes from everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not, it's not any more lofty than that. <laughs> um, but I do that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes I make mechanical things like I've made a lot of these puppets and sometimes they're mechanized. Mm. Um, and sometimes I just like, I animate things because it's nice to see things move and that, that the movement is what communicates the emotion like how something moves mm -hmm. um and sometimes i make things um sculpturally digitally photographically i guess it's just sort of finding the right medium that says what you want but also allows for this what because this was also new i was kind of just also just testing materials like what could it do you know like what happens if i try to do this with the stitching or maybe i try to do it with the fabric um so um in terms of yeah uh, so motivation I'm, was just purely emotional <laughs> so there have been a few questions about actually this um this a question by shira schwartz about um a huge congratulations on your pandemic art making i was struck by how um by your use of the word felt to describe the medium and material of these mm. pieces. Um, so I think, uh, uh, but when you said that, uh, but when you said that's the end of the felt pieces, I was really struck <laughs> that these pieces are the way of feeling, which is true, texturally and emotionally. And yeah. that's the limit um, and yeah. end to those pieces um, that we can feel. Can you speak to the, the registers of feeling that you're trying to capture of real and imagined and those limits? Um, she also says, um, also, I love how you visualize uh, these hearings as scenes of sonic hearing devices. Um, so you've spoken a little bit, mm. that, uh, <laughs> if you'd like to um, add, I will just add to this question because I, I think it could be a good piggyback by Mia Risberg, uh, which is about, um, um, you know, um, I really like how the work conveys strong feelings, uh, yet there, there is whimsy. Uh, I was wondering how you picked felt as a material mm. and also how you chose the colors you worked with. So, um, you know, you spoke a little bit about felt, but the colors are mm. actually also a really important part. Um, yeah. Um, how do I pick the materials uh okay so practically speaking <laughs> uh when you do a uh, free motion sewing which is what i'm doing when i'm drawing uh it works much better when the material is thicker so i had tried it on canvas because i was thinking oh i'll sort of you know mimic the 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 grandi the grandeur of painting on canvas but it didn't work at all it just was it doesn't have that body that felt has uh, and so I had tried a number of things trying to thicken them up and, and, um, I tried thin felt and that didn't work. So, you know, I mean, I really went through about a hundred different materials trying to figure out the right one. So in a way, the decision to do it on felt was both like a preference that that was, it feels good and thick and feels substantial, but it's also practical, um, in that it holds the stitching really mm. well. Um, so it makes it easier for me. I mean, it's hard to sew giant things and maneuver them through the sewing machine, but it, it, as a thing that kind of stands up on its own as art, uh, it feels more substantial. Um, in terms of color, I don't know. I think I'm, it's all quilting cotton. You can get in a million different shades. And I just like the simplicity of solids. Mm. Um, it's almost, you know, like children's cutouts of, um, for books, you know, sort of like children's drawings or something. But um, uh, the colors also are a little bit practical, too, because the felt comes in only three, no, four 
shades. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, you know, a, like a butcher paper. It just comes in this giant rolls. So it comes in white or I use like an ivory. It comes in gray, different colors of gray, mm -hmm. and it comes in black. And in order to make the, the objects pop out, I really have to use a bright color, you know, mm -hmm. a bright thread. Um, mm -hmm. So in a way it's kind of practical. It's also just, I like bright colors. So it's kind of both a, a intuitive choice from mm -hmm. my perspective of just taste. And then also a practical one because of um, things, if you want them to really pop on that and in that medium, it really needs to be bright. Okay, great. Um, but in terms of like felt and feeling, Shira, uh, <laughs> I would say I, it was a sort of funny, yeah, I didn't intend that sort of wordplay, but uh, um, I would say, sorry, just, I would say that when I, what? Oh, sorry, what? No, I was just going to say that's been picked up by a few people, felt and feeling. I think Christy Merrill as well. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Well, I said, uh, yeah, that's the end of the felt pieces. Yeah, the end of feeling as we know it. Um, <laughs> I would say that when I'm, when I'm working on these pieces, I don't permanently put anything down till I'm, till I feel sure that those are the things that need to be in the picture. And I'm constantly like rotating between sizes of things and colors of things and which things and how much things. And it all just boils down. I really just keep taking away until it's just what I need to say that feeling, you know, to convey that moment, mm. like in the OBGYN, you know, office, or that moment uh, when she's giving testimony. Um, I don't want anything extra because I don't need it. I just want the most minimal way to say, it's almost like the difference between pro <laughs> poetry and prose, right? Like a, sort of just getting to the essence of choosing which words to use, choosing exactly what symbols to use and no more. Great. Um, so there are a couple more, I mean, there are a few questions. I'm gonna, um, I'd like to um, sort of pair a couple together. So there is one um, by James Sheehan, and, uh, and they say that, um, I love your work. Uh, can you talk about your characters as political bodies? Oh, that was an interesting. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the conversations just ended up being between a red chair and a blue chair, which I didn't do intentionally, <laughs> you know, uh, given our political, um, the way we represent politics in the U.S. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, there's definitely that kind of symbolism that could be interpreted, um, political bodies. I mean, the chairs and some of the lights for me, the chairs are sort of intentional, like corporate CEO chairs and Senator chairs, the chairs that I associate with power um, and a lot of times masculinity. Um, so those are kind of political bodies. Uh, um, and then the more humble chairs are just kind of maybe like the people's chairs. <laughs> um, but the fact that they're red and blue also, I guess, signifies um, a certain kind of conversation or a political um, pa party or perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Um, and then there was a question about um, you know, uh, the relevance of this work um, in the sort of COVID, you know, in this time, um, I believe I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Um, you know, I guess when we just prior to starting, we were talking about, um, you know, when you uh, were making this work, of course, uh, with the previous election of the Supreme Court um, judge, and here we are again. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, um, and so can you speak a little bit about um, this, the kind of, perhaps it's a back and forth or the process of how, um, when you're working with material, um, which on one hand uh, feels is so current, is sort of changing, um, you know, as we, you know, as we speak or, you know, within the days of us um, making, processing, 
Um, so can you speak a little bit of, about that? Um, I mean, and, and also, I suppose, um, you know, with the Me Too movement um, at large, right? I mean, of course, we talked about uh, the trials uh, with mm. Dr. Blasey Ford, but, um, you know, and then, of course, there have been, um, you know, many more, many ongoing. Um, mm. And so, um, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that sort of making work um, that uh, um, making work that is so current or in this sort of in this time that's really yeah contemporary I mean I guess yeah I mean I guess I made the work about Christine Blasey Ford after the fact um, also you know I know I know just making work about contemporary news or current events isn't doesn't always hold up <laughs> against the test of time. So it was also trying to take this event, which might be forgotten by future generations or not even people might not even know about it, um, but still be able to translate the, the feeling and the kind of core experience of her testimony and um, the, the hearing itself and the behavior of everyone in that hearing. Uh, so trying to make it also hold up beyond whether you know that or not. Um, in terms of the fact that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of women are not believed or that the, 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 the one with the whistleblowers and the for me, like they all, they all have a box. They're all bringing like the same story to like the head person who uh, has a box of their own <laughs> that's different. Um, it's just another way to sort of talk about um, the pattern that and that makes this that that a lot of times happens when people um, raise. Uh, tell their story and make it public, make their, um, either their experience or their observations public. Mm -hmm. As we've seen lately, what happens to whistleblowers. Um, so but in terms of making the work, yeah, I don't know. I, I like to make it go beyond just the current event too. Sure. I guess there was one, um, I, I thought this was uh, actually very well written too, by Sarah Enser, and she says, um, you are a real life genius, I agree. Um, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for uh, existing. I'm curious how you're thinking about the topics that animate your work, uh, relational distance, power dynamics, the vulnerabilities of the aging female body, the status of the medical uh, establishment, the media landscape. Um, has has been altered by the context of COVID. Um, and she says, I saw your work last mm -hmm. before we began quarantining in March and I'm struck by the new found relevance and power today. So, um, you know, one of the things that also really strikes me through this question is this, um, you know, and within your work, of course, I mean, you know, these sort of public sort of what become a pr very private experience and moment that has become a public spectacle mm. consumption. Um, but at the same mm. time, um, you know, uh, that sort of room in the doc, you know, in the doctor's office or in the therapist's office, you know, mm. or, um, you know, having, uh, mm -hmm. having mm. one leg up on the stirrup and uh, that sort of vulnerability is a very intimate, very, very personal, <laughs> private experience, right? Um, and, um, mm. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and 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 um, and so this sort of back and forth between a, a very private sort of moment um, and experience um, and um, you know where it lives within um, you know the power the power dynamic uh, you know of um, you know what agency for example of women or uh, you know women's mm -hmm. bodies in a mm -hmm. sort of public um, um, the sort of public. Uh, um, in the public, right, or in society at large. Um, and so it really mm. struck me, in, uh, again, mm -hmm. uh, as you were talking about, you know, retelling these experiences as sort of a re-performance, of course, there's a, um, you know, telling it to a public audience, um, uh, that sort right. of, um, which, you know, uh, is a very physical, again, another, uh, another uh, much more public 
um, level of violation, right, that we're talking about. Um, yeah. I feel like you've captured really. Uh, I guess. <laughs> Power drinks, vulnerabilities of the female body. I mean, I think things about how things have changed with COVID. I mean, there's a lot of things that just I can't capture in my work, but I think the distancing is one thing that appears in the work. Um, and the, I don't know, there's distance, but there's also a kind of intimacy too. Like, you know, the whole way, my favorite thing when I'm watching TV now is to look at what everybody's background is. Like <laughs> whether they've staged it with an American flag or, or um, you know, it's just like some really messy bookshelves or maybe it's a hotel room, whatever. I mean, there's a kind of intimacy now with, with conversing that you see into your professor's space or your student's space um, that's changed that you know in a way gives me different kind of information that I would never get if I saw them in class in person as a professor at least mm -hmm. um, and then you know I think there's a lot of things because we're not able to be out in public like we used to be there's a lot of things that are just completely out of sight out of mind you know the whether that's um, certain populations like older people that are just staying inside. Um, there's a lot that's hidden too. So, um, or just not visible and mm -hmm. getting ignored, you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, in terms of, there's something that I haven't quite captured that I'm trying to do in a video piece is sort of this idea of, um, that, well, not being believed is one thing. And so I tie the, the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford and the women and many of the people in the Me Too movement and their stories and not being believed to other instances of, this, of a similar experience where, uh, for example, it's been shown that when older women go to the doctor and complain about something, they're not taken seriously. And it's very common for doctors to kind of wave off their complaints, whether it's because they're women or because they're older or maybe both. Um, you know, so this woman's experiencing whatever it is, physical ailment, but then to not be believed by her own doctor, I mean, it's been proven that that happens, um, is a similar situation of being not be being believed. Whatever your personal story and experiences, you start to doubt whether that, do I really feel that? I mean, and it's similar with sort of racist or sexist comments, right? You hear someone say something and then, you're not sure how to react. And then somebody says, oh, they were just joking. You know, it's not as bad as you think, whatever the, whatever the situation was. And so it's easy, you know, for me or for a lot of people just sort of say, oh yeah, maybe it wasn't that bad, but it feels really bad, right? Yeah. Um, the sort of second, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the side effect or the sort of outcome of all of the scrutiny and the kind of like dismissal ends up being, that you end up questioning or did not denying your own reality of what you experienced, right? There's this kind of secondary, bigger effect of, of not even trusting your own instincts. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, I, don't know, I went off um, on a tangent on that, but. Yeah, I think, you know, I wanted to, uh, Jim Cogswell uh, writes, and I think it's, um, you know, puts it really well in terms of, um, it is ironic and eloquent that the felt pieces address the failure of language to communicate, but you communicate the lack of communication so effectively uh, with such <laughs> you know, cues. Um, but I think, uh, you know, and that's something that I was thinking about that's too, is this, um, you know, it's like language isn't enough, right? Um, to perhaps, you know, um, mm. uh, maybe we're, um, uh, you know, there are things that, um, yeah, cannot be put to words or, um, beyond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess I, I you know, so, uh, some artists are really good with words. I mean, I'm, I'm okay, but I think I'm definitely a visual thinker. I mean, almost any idea or concept that, uh, I can think of, I can visualize it better than I can put it in mm -hmm. words and um i think the challenge with this work because i'm not using text or words um and i don't use text well but i don't use text much or 
voiceover language in my animations either. It's the same thing. I just like the gesture to say it all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, when I was, when I'm making the pieces, it's that same thing that I was describing earlier. It's just sort of like, it's sort of like making a poem or a haiku or something, you know, that the, it's what's the minimum amount to convey the emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of just a, it happens just by trial and error and trying a lot of different things and then kind of removing things mm. till you just have the essentials. Mm -hmm. So we have one last question and I think it's sort of, uh, we're kind of at time right now, uh, but perhaps if you can uh, speak to this very, um, you know, briefly, um, is about the piece Surveillance Hill. Um, I know we've talked about that mm. one. Uh, before. Um, and so um, can you talk a bit about the piece, what it means for us, especially women, uh, to be con constantly under scrutiny with social media, uh, uh, but also under surveillance, uh, you know, uh, both online and in real life? Hmm. I mean, on some level, <laughs> I was trying to make more, put more attention on the cameras and the kind of audience part of it you know that that ultimately there's nothing on that hill i mean i had tried putting a lot of different things and it just seemed to work more powerfully when i just removed everything from the hill because uh, originally i had like two chairs on top of the hill and they were going to be having a conversation it was just like too much information as soon as i took everything off i thought oh this is exactly what it is it's a lot of nothing everybody's wanting all this information and tuning into this all this broadcast and um it's more it's for me it's saying more about the 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 hunger or the the over the over the exaggerated need for documenting and capturing every single thing in our lives um mm -hmm. but at the same time that hill is a la is layered and uh sort of got all stratifications of historical you know almost like a archaeological dig there's a sense that there's history under that hill um, that i'm not showing you so there's a kind of striated layers of dirt or history that's there but not there but um yeah but in a way it's sort of like drawing attention to the senators i wanted to draw attention to the the cameras and the, the hungry cameras um that surround us all the time Perhaps there's a pattern as well, which you've also <laughs> a pattern um, um, in of you know what gets snuck on the r the rug, you know what manages to bypass. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, um, right, right. What escapes? What escapes? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, I think we have to leave it at that. Um, but, um, you know, once again, um, I want to say thank you so much, Heidi, uh, for bringing this work uh, to, um, you know, for doing this amazing work and for us having the opportunity to be able to show it. I think it's extremely important uh, work, one that helps us also, um, you know, there's, we haven't, we didn't manage to touch on memory and recollections, uh, but I think this work um, mm. helps us um, sort of, um, you know, in terms of the real and the imagined, um, what remains in our collective, um, 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 memory and a sort of um, moment. So thank you. Hmm. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jennifer hmm. for organizing thank you. Uh, the, the, um, our event today. Um, and um, uh, just to let you all know, um, you know, Stamps Gallery, once again, Stamps Gallery is open now, a limited hours on Tuesdays and Fridays to the UM community. Um, and for, the, for those of you that, that we're unable to welcome to the gallery, please do uh, uh, check out the show online. Um, and should you have any specific questions, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me um, um, and, uh, you know, to us at the gallery and we will find, uh, you know, we will try our best to, um, you know, simulate an experience of you being <laughs> at the gallery as much as uh, possible through, um, you know, images and, um, you know, what have you. So, so thank you. Um, 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank the you. audience, for tuning in. I know your attention is requested in many contexts. So great to have you here. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. Everyone. Bye. bye. <laughs>